everyone my name is Evie Lupine and welcome back to my channel today we have a very special guest with us we have Carly DeVille of the Naughty Licious podcast and the Carly DeVille YouTube channel and we're covering so many fun highly requested subjects today from cross-dressing to pegging to sissification and I'm so excited to get into that but before we do would you like to introduce yourself to the audience Carly? Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, my name is Carly DeVille. I'm a sexologist. I'm a therapist. I'm a content creator. <laughs> I'm like, what else am I? I'm sure there's something else that I haven't <laughs> noticed. But uh, yeah, I make content on kink, BDSM, sissification, love talking with people, um, learning about kinks and fetishes and all sorts of taboo topics. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's my passion. I'm excited to talk mm -hmm. about it. <laughs> so, all that good stuff yeah so for the sexology thing how did you get into that was that always what you knew you wanted to do or like what was your path in that direction yeah so when i was very god i was definitely way too young <laughs> than i should have been watching tv but mm. there was like a dr sue i don't know if she was a doctor but it was like a sue johansson she oh. was yeah she had a show that would come out very very late at night and she would answer people's mm. questions and she'd have like her vagina toys and like all sorts of things and she'd be talking all sorts of crazy stuff to me at that time you know and i was mm. fascinated and i was like how do you become that but there's no you know when you're going to school no one's like you know this is how you do how you talk about sex on camera mm. so i ended up deciding you know going to to counseling i did the whole psychology and counseling mm. and it wasn't until i started doing counseling where i kept getting couples that were sent to me from other therapists when they had sex related issues and they didn't know they didn't feel comfortable talking with them about that so mm. they would send them over, over to me because i i was comfortable talking about that <laughs> <Yeah>. you know <laughs> i had a lot of fun talking about that and because of that you know i just kept getting more education focus on sexuality and sex and in mm. the process i started a youtube channel which was more counseling related in the beginning mm. and then I just took a turn to some very intense like kink and BDSM and stuff like that. And then my channel got deleted and <laughs> YouTube, <laughs> my problems, got deleted. Yeah. YouTube problems. Mm -hmm. But I'm back because you can't keep a real bitch down <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> got to keep talking. You know, it amazes me the things that they will censor, mm. which are educational, like mm -hmm. There's so many things on media and on YouTube itself that are like highly sexual and suggestive for entertainment purposes or just for shock value. And that's fine. But, mm -hmm. you know, when you're trying to educate people on how to do those things safely, then you start having some problems. And I just think it's bizarre. Yeah, it's very strange the way YouTube reacts to stuff because it's almost like you can have something be on their platform. It's like a music video or like those really, they don't really happen as much anymore, but like the really sexualized thumbnails of like girls in bikinis yeah. and then being like, oh my God, I took her top off. And those are all fine. But then if somebody wants to search on YouTube for like, what is vaginal sex like? Or like what's mm -hmm. anal? Like that's like, no, shut that down. It's inappropriate. And it's like, well, your front page is like, <laughs> full of sexuality. I just feel like it's like a microcosm of society as a whole where it's like displaying sexuality for commercial reasons is fine. But when you actually yeah. want to talk about it, that's when they're like, mm, none of that. Please. It's bizarre. And like each platform comes with their own little like uh, crazy like you can do this and you can say this and but not that. Um, one of my videos on TikTok was muted. And I think it was like God, I don't even remember. It might have been about pegging. So okay. it wasn't anything too too hardcore, but the sound was removed. And yet while I was, you know, scrolling through TikTok, the sound for Kim Petra, treat me like a slut and I like to fuck are all on there, which I love. But I'm like, hmm, you know. <laughs> oh my gosh. What's it like being a, like a, I don't know if you still are, but if you do sex education on TikTok, what's that like? Because I've never been on TikTok because I've heard that their censorship is just like, next level even compared to youtube yeah 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 it's definitely next level especially compared to youtube <laughs> but it's very like trial and error mm -hmm. like you will have to keep uploading similar to youtube in that way well well you'll upload something and they're like no you can't do this and then mm -hmm. you just kind of try again it's very very difficult and you'll have to like mute certain words that mm -hmm. 
like you know even orgasm i think one of the was like no you can't say orgasm even though there's lots of videos that say orgasm so i think it just really depends mm. you don't there's no straightforward way so it's really really difficult but there's there's so much great content on tiktok i, I love tiktok and yeah i was already banned on tiktok like twice but I'm that's not- also just TikTok. <laughs> i feel like tiktok yeah. is like even more liberal with the ban hammer than youtube is yes like just like anything for no reason i'm kind of curious though i don't know how much you interact with like sort of the younger age set on TikTok, but what you mean like teenagers or like younger adults, do you think that that TikTok censorship has any sort of effect on how they talk about sex or how they understand sex? Because, oh my gosh, I was a teenager, like pretty well into like social media being established. It was definitely like Facebook was the peak thing when I was a teenager. But even just with that, there were so many misconceptions that got thrown around about sex just because of social media. And I'm curious if you made any observations about TikTok maybe being similar for just this next generation under us? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a very interesting question because although I make the content, the the sex related content, Mm. I don't get sex related content on my, except for the people that I follow, Mm. you know, like I'll get theirs, but I'll just get a whole bunch of like, I'm like, what do I get? It's more like funny stuff that I get, which mm. is pretty good from TikTok. They're really good. Their algorithm is usually on point. Mm. You know, like whenever you're in the mood for something, you'll usually open it and it'll for the most part be something related to that. Mm. But um, but I do follow a lot of great um, kink talk creators. Mm. And I think it's great because I know that there's just so many misconceptions out there. And I feel that the more people are just talking about their experiences mm. and how they went about it in a healthy way, or you know the way that they had to learn the hard way it helps prevent people from making those same mistakes so there's just so much more information Mm. that you know the younger generation can have before they even make that decision Mm -hmm. to get into a certain you know like a king or act or something Mm because I feel like a lot of us that grew up without all the social media it was very like you learned as you went along the way you know it wasn't like like, oh, you know what? I'm very interested in this. I might want to, you know, I'm interested in breath play. Let mm. me find out more about it. So by the time that I do do it, it's very safe and I don't feel in danger or whatever. Mm. You know, you people without it had to just kind of figure it, figure it yeah. out as they went. Yeah, we had a lot, of, a lot of guesswork growing up, I feel like, when it came to yeah. like, what is, like, I didn't even know when I was younger, how long did it take me to figure out what an, like, I didn't know what masturbation was until I was like mm-hmm. 13 and a friend had to tell me about it. And it was like after after I'd done like health class and I'd, I'd learned that like they'd done the whole like birds and the bees talk in school by that yeah. point, but they just never even brought up that self-pleasure was a concept that existed. And I just feel like that leads to so much experimentation, which can be good mm-hmm. and healthy, but right. also a lot of like unnecessary you can fall victim things. to yeah. things yeah mm-hmm. yeah exactly yeah if you don't know better you know you it's it's almost easier for you to be taken advantage of yeah. and also for you to do things that are going to hurt yourself just because you don't know any better mm-hmm. exactly so kind of going more into the main subjects that i wanted to talk about today mm-hmm. um hmm, where do you want to start i think let's start with cross-dressing because i feel like that's going to be the one. Well, that is specification people have very strong yeah. opinions about. So yes, I'm, yes. I'm kind of curious how, well, I guess maybe let's start here. Where do you see sort of the difference between cross-dressing and specification if you think that there is one? Mm-hmm. So I would say that cross-dressing, cross-dressing is definitely its own thing. You mm. know, like a cross-dressing is like a standalone dish and sissification is like an elaborate concoction that cross-dressing is an ingredient of, ah. but not necessarily like the main course, you know? Yeah, okay. Okay, so do you think that cross-dressing, is it more of a kink thing or is it separate from kink and like outside of the BDSM community, but like mm-hmm. sometimes used by kinky people? Well, that varies and that's why like this topic Mm. is probably really really hard for people to talk about just because i mean when you're talking about 50 shades of gray there is like a thousand shades of sissy you know yeah exactly exactly (laughs) yeah so for some people cross-dressing on its own is not sexual and it's more about getting in touch with their with their femininity Mm. or 
um, a lot of people would do it to like self-soothe. So mm. cross-dressing would be like this interest that with studies, I'm sure as time has gone by, those studies are probably going to be very, very different. Mm. But people found that uh, some studies found that people who were into cross-dressing would do it as a form of stress relief. Ah. And yeah, and when they would stop, they'd be like, I can't do this, you know, maybe felt shame about it, mm. or maybe they couldn't because their partner didn't understand or whatever the reason, they would stop. In moments in their life when they were very stressful, they would go back to cross-dressing. So they would use that as a, like, a soothing, uh, maybe that would help them release some emotions mm. or just feel like they're, like, it's okay to be more emotional or whatever it is that they felt, but they use it more as a coping skill. Mm. And then there's those that use cross-dressing as a part for sexual gratification, you mm. know, which that is more in line with the sissification, uh, like, kinks that we, mm. when there's, I, I say kinks because it's like, there's the sissies that want to be humiliated there's a sissies who just want to feel sexy there's a sissies who want to be a maid there's the sissies who want to be a hot mess um, <laughs> i mean there's just so many you know and not all of them are sexual per se but like with a lot of things in bdsm you know mm. i think that's one of the biggest misconceptions is and all bdsm activities are all about sex and mm. we know that that's not the case yeah would you say though that there is like a a weight either way between if it's more common that it's a stress relief thing or if it's like a fetish or sex thing or is it pretty 50 50. I feel that it's becoming more of a sex thing just mm. I mean you're we're seeing it more and more and more you know like the interest in that is keeps getting um more intense mm. <laughs> like to now where I think anyone can scroll on Twitter if they're like looking for anything naughty mm. and they will come across like touches of the cross-dressing and the sissification. Yeah. You know, what I find is different is that traditionally the cross-dressing was done by people who were heterosexual. Mm. And now we're seeing that people that are enjoying cross-dressing, it's not even necessarily like cross-dressing. It's more of like, they're just using the, the sexual aspects of it. You know, they like mm. feeling sexy. They like the lingerie mm -hmm. or just like the feeling naughty or the taboo. So it is becoming a lot more sexualized, but yet of course it will still be people who use it as a, way to self-soothe for whatever reason that they might yeah. be using it for it's really interesting to me like how many kinks seem to go back to this desire for like self-soothing and stress relief like whether that be yeah. pet play cross-dressing mm -hmm. pain play sadism like all of that mm -hmm. like stress relief yeah. is continually one of the top things yeah. and that really makes I me know. wonder like dang we all need a lot of stress relief right and whether it be know. in any form you know yeah, or just the way you're working through things. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most um, shocking things for people is when people are using um, like uh, CNC, for example, mm. the consensual non-consent to mm. work through different traumas that they had um, mm. and that they find some like soothing and stress relief through that. And I think that's one of those things where people would be like, what, how, you know, but, you know, it's a way for you to rewrite the past and kind of get control over maybe a situation that you didn't. And now you're doing it in a way that's on your terms for mm. the most part, and you feel safe and stuff like that. So I think a lot of the control and feeling in control or out of control, you know, depending yeah, on where yeah. you fall in the, in the equation, is just really relaxing to, to mm. everyone. Yeah. So along along those lines of like the sex versus the relaxation side of things, I'm curious if you remember the trend on TikTok of like the boys dressing up as maids and like that oh, was yeah, like yeah, the yeah, cat yeah. trend. What is your feeling about that? Do you think that was just like a trend or was there something like sort of behind that? It's uh, well, one of the um, when I made with my previous channel I had so mm. much content on this but um I identified seven types of sissies uh, mm. just because I'm working with so many people I noticed like there's just so many different types and one of them is a sissy maid mm. so that's been a thing since before TikTok mm -hmm. and it kind of goes back to and that that one's a little tricky because again you know it's so complex where and problematic in some forms mm. but as we know not all kinks all kinks have some level of like problematic yeah. you know elements to it that you work through in a way that makes sense for you and is respectful to the people that you're with and the maid part where it's 
So simplification is pretty much like the engaging in, it's a form of training of being mm. hyper feminine, whether that is through like sexual ways or if you're coerced or forced in, forced into it, you mm. know, because that's again, part of the fantasy. Um, and some of it does have its roots on the humiliation and the basis that like a man who is more like feminine that that's something to be humiliated with and way back there was a form of punishment called petticoating where oh. people yeah where people would um shame or you know like it was a punishment put on little boys when they would oh. misbehave they would put like a skirt on them and they'd be made fun of you know wow. yeah any any time they do anything like that i'm like no you're just giving somebody a fetish like i know, I know. anything like that because i'm not sure like how familiar you are with the research around this but there's a book that i always recommend the name of it i'm forgetting right now but it talks a lot about uh, like the process of like eroticizing, especially like yeah. humiliating or shameful events as a way to process it. And that very mm -hmm. much feels like that kind of thing where it then ends up becoming a fetish image because it's easier to process it through something that's erotic than it is to like- Exactly, you know, like, in sh right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you eroticize it. So it's no longer something that per gives you like pain or distress. It's mm -hmm. something that is now like exciting and very sexy, mm -hmm. you know, so it does have its roots uh, originally in that humiliation and the whole like mm -hmm. a, a guy being more feminine is shameful. Mm -hmm. um, so you're teaching them essentially, you know, you're teaching them how to be hyper, hyper feminine and those more stereotypical gender norms and roles of like cleaning and being you know doing the dishes and mm. doing tea parties associated with like the maid has become a, a huge staple in that particular um, subset of people who enjoy specification and it's like a lot of they have a lot of fun with it too and the, mm -hmm. the dominants have a lot of fun too because it's not just having like a, a little maid around your house you know doing your thing but you know they'll host like tea parties mm. and they'll be they can maybe be the human furniture mm -hmm. uh they can provide entertainment to the friends and then I know you love, we both love everything cat related. <laughs> yeah. So with like anime and things like that, that mm. love like the cat imagery, I think they just mm. kind of blend it together. And it's like, it's really a thing right now. The yeah. cat maid. Oh yeah. That's like, that's like such a right so now cute. thing that like anime yeah. cat girl thing. I kind of wonder actually, do they have any research about like where an interest in cross-dressing comes from? Like, cause you'll hear of studies where people will say, oh, the reason why people ha like foot fetishes are so common is because of this, like it's close to this part of the brain, the sex of yeah. the genitals and yada, yada. Do they have any studies where they've evaluated that for cross-dressing or like any observations you have about that? I not that I've seen, but it's a really tricky. I feel like it'll be a couple more years before mm. you would even be able to get some good definitive findings from that kind of research because mm. the some of the generations before us, you know, it was very taboo to even want to put on some panties, yeah. you know, or or have long hair or anything like mm. that. So it's it's so interesting when people are so ashamed of things that even in an anonymous survey, they will uh, not reveal, you know, what what made them do this or what made them do that. But I feel that now people are a little bit more open sexually. So we mm. might get closer to, to finding out, but mm. you know, it depends because also you also get into the whole with cross-dressing where people are maybe experimenting with their gender identity, but uh, not necessarily doing it for a sexual purpose. Uh, mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, so actually one of the things I do want to talk about is sort of like the intersection with cross-dressing and sissy stuff with also uh, non-cis gender identities. Like, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, well, there's, there's sort of a group of people that think that cross-dressing is dismissive of like trans identities and like sort of making fun of like oh you're mm -hmm. a man who's trying to pretend to be a woman and like how how much of it do you think is like maybe that's true or how much of it is it's like the early stages of like exploring gender in like a way that feels safe mm -hmm. i feel that for a lot of people it would be a good way to start in a way that feels safe because when you're thinking about sissification in particular and forced feminization which is the other side of mm. the of that that coin mm -hmm. you know they're very they take away your um 
it's not like you did it because you wanted to do it. You mm. did it because your partner forced you to do it mm-hmm. or they oh, asked you to do it and you're just submitting to them. So you're doing mm-hmm. it for them. So you're able to do it in a place where you're not, you don't have to take res- full responsibility. So it's easier mm-hmm. to engage in it. Cause it's like, well, I don't want to put on panties. My girlfriend's forcing me to put on panties and you know, we have fun with that. And, and a lot of the things in the sissification, a lot of the activities in sissification, you know, can play into that. Like the force, bisexual you know um kinks and stuff it's like maybe on their own they've always wondered like what is it like to like put a penis in my mouth you know they yeah. always wondered about it but mm-hmm. they just could not but all of a sudden they have this like really dominant partner whether male or female that is like you know i want you to do this so then all of a sudden it's like it's not i don't want to do that it's my my mistress is making me suck this dick you know <laughs> Yeah, I always think that's really interesting. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about like forced by as a kink because yeah. it feels like this very interesting way of exploring sexual orientation and sex acts that if you, especially if you are like a man who's invested in like, you know, heterosexual like mainstream culture and ideas about masculinity you're like oh like i might think a little bit about wanting to know what sucking a dick's like but i could never do that because even doing it once makes me permanently gay and then right, my right, whole life's right. ruined uh, and, right, and right. Sort of, you know even though obviously like i don't think that that should be the case but there's sort of that idea that oh no this is so dangerous to try and explore it and then forced by sort of allows this place where you can explore other ways of engaging in sex that maybe you might be into but that you you know again it's Mm -hmm. that like uh, somebody's forcing me to do it it's not my fault don't blame me Uh, this mean lady made me suck this dick and i know (laughs) so i kind of wonder like is that like if you asked people that engage in kinks like that do you think they would consider themselves bisexual or is it strictly just in a forced context where like they would primarily identify as straight I feel like a lot of them would primarily identify as straight. That's Mm. what I have found in the people that I work with are. Okay. But see, that's a thing Mm. where people don't necessarily go to a sex coach or a therapist when they're really excited and happy and everything's going well, you know, they go see a therapist or a, a coach or whatever, where they're trying to make something work. They have some sort of distress over something, or maybe they, Mm. they not, they don't have the knowledge or the tools to do something. So, you know, that, makes things a little different but Mm, by far most of the people that i do see are like i would say like maybe 75 percent straight and 25 percent bisexual that they Mm. say that they are okay interesting Mm -hmm. i kind of wonder as sort of you talked about cross-dressing like becoming more sexual and it's definitely more visible because of places like TikTok. Do you think that might change? Like it might be something where people are more open to using bisexual as a label versus straight? Or I almost wonder like would that kind of ruin the kink? Like if male bisexuality is like so much more accepting, like would that sort of get rid of it in a way? Because that taboo is not there. Right. I feel like at the very at the very foundational level of this kink is the is submission, mm. you know, so I feel that that almost trumps sexuality ah. because that whole like, especially when we're talking about people who are I, who I do identify as straight, mm-hmm. you know, surrendering their manlyhood or their heterosexuality mm-hmm. is like the ultimate surrender for them. Mm-hmm. So that alone, you know, could be a huge the surrendering their sexuality and their masculinity to someone can be so much more sexually gratifying than maybe like a same sex contact that they might have during the specification process. Yeah. Okay. Now it makes sense. So earlier you mentioned dominance that enjoy cisification and cross-dressing. I really feel like mm-hmm. that's an important topic to explore because I think the stereotype a lot of people have, and certainly like when I get comments and questions from people, and maybe you've observed this in your own practice, is you get a lot of people that are in like a super long-term relationship with somebody and they, they really want to be able to explore cross-dressing, mm-hmm. but they don't feel safe about coming right. out about it almost is like I have this big scary thing I've hid in this closet please yeah. still accept me and love me yeah, and yeah, there's yeah. sort of this this fear of like am I forcing my partner to do this like or I feel like my girlfriend's not really into this or my boyfriend's not really into this and I'm making them do it for my sake but not really their own and so I'm kind of wondering like what are the motivations and enjoyment like a dominant would get out of engaging in this kind of play Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really tough one. Because uh, like you said, uh, 
a, a lot of the time. And again, I feel that it, things are changing now, mm -hmm. right? But for maybe a whole other older generation that are maybe like already, they've been in marriages for like a really long time and they definitely never talked about anything sexual related with mm -hmm. their partner. They definitely have a really hard time talking with their partner about it. And that's usually most of the people that would come to see like a sex therapist or sexologist, counselor, or whatever is when there is that disconnect. Most of the, the time that I meet clients, it's where maybe they they're discovered you know mm. where it's like i i caught my husband wearing oh. my panties or i he left his laptop open and i i saw the porn that he's watching so it's more of that first initially the main problem the main concern for the girlfriend the wife is usually like are they gay and mm. are they trans you know mm. like is this has this whole relationship been a lie wow. so that is usually the first thing that you need to work through before you get into the whole like okay well what could it what could be in it for you you know mm -hmm. but through the work once you realize once they come to terms with their partners who they are and they were the same person they probably had the same interests before they even met them you know and yeah. if they were with someone else they would still have those interests so it's not like the feeling that most people have when they cast their partner you know in a kink that they don't know about or mm -hmm. like fantasizing about things that they don't know about where they feel like am i not enough you know like if uh, i'm if i was enough then why would they feel the need to be doing this you know once you work through that then it's like okay it's not about it has nothing to do with you if this is who they are this is what they enjoy with or without you they would be the same mm -hmm. so let's not take it personally but now how can we work together where you can both get what you want? You want to see your partner happy. Now, what can they do so you can be happy? What are some things that maybe you have wanted to try that you've never talked about or your partner has agreed to? Maybe mm -hmm. now you guys can come to some terms where you can both explore parts of your pers uh, personality and your, your sexual being in mm -hmm. a place that's safe. And that bonds people a lot more. The mm -hmm. main thing everyone wants is to feel accepted by the person that they're with. Mm -hmm. And that's that's why people end up turning to like sex workers because they want to stay in the relationship but, but they still want to get those needs met mm -hmm. and a lot of the times you know like the i've talked to like a lot of dominatrices and stuff like that they will tell you they the the um, so we we're calling them a john you know but that, <laughs> Client, I guess, yeah. The client, yeah, mm -hmm. the client would love if they could do this with their partner to have it like not be secret and stuff like that. But at that moment, they just don't feel safe. Yeah. So creating a place where everyone feels safe and then you can start exploring and just that bonding of trying it. And the biggest thing that people have like the biggest problem that people will develop in life is regret you know it all uh, centers around regret and if you don't really feel that you tried everything to save your relationship or save your marriage you're going to be living with that regret forever but if you say you know i gave it a shot it didn't work out mm. that relationship may end but it will end in a way that's amicable and in a way that respects and honors the relationship that was yeah and then also at the same time like you have to recognize when a relationship isn't working for the people involved versus trying to stay in something for the sake of just having a relationship. Because yeah. maybe if you go through that process of like, well, I could go in the opposite direction as well. Like if you go through the process of opening up to one partner and getting to be free with that, you're like, oh, cat's out of the bag. I might as well like look for a relationship where right away I know if this needs going to be met or not. But I guess it could also make people shut down and go that was horrible i'm never going to talk about it again i lost the love of my life i'm never going to yeah. find anyone like that again and it kind of causes the spiral of like i should have never tried to be open because that was bad but i know yeah. but at the end of the day it's like you always have to look at you have to think long term mm -hmm. it's like yes that one moment was maybe very traumatic and you did lose this person but now you're opening up the doors to have an honest life where you can find a partner who is equally as passionate as throwing some panties on you and calling calling you their dirty little slut as you are you mm -hmm. know and that you will feel happier than ever and for the most part people people's relationships get better as they go to the next relationship unless yeah. you know they're toxic and they're dealing with all of that that yeah. might not work out but mm -hmm. for the most part you find you're always anytime we break up with someone we think like i will never find anyone like this and you won't to a certain extent because you're going to be find someone whose situation is more closely aligned as long as you do the work and you know you recognize the red flags and all that stuff mm -hmm. the next relationship should technically be better
Yes. Yes. It always is about yeah. building and and having that progress. But let's yeah. say let's say that they you have a couple and they're successful in like talking about cross dressing and they want to explore with that. What would you recommend for dipping your toes in the water of starting to explore that with a partner? Dipping the toes, fantasy talk is always a great non-threatening way to get the ball rolling with that. Um, and it is also a way to start gauging how your partner will react to certain things. Because mm. with specification, there is just so much. You know, we're talking like uh, anal training. Uh, we're talking... Mm chastity play we're talking bond there's just so many things that people you know it's not just like put on an outfit and that's it for the most part you know mm -hmm. there are some that that just, like more in line with the just cross-dressing or just being in the outfit is really like exciting and that's the thing but it's like once you're in the outfit now what you know now what are we gonna yeah. do so there's a lot of elements that you can do and while you're fantasizing while you're talking to each other having that dirty talk or like you know mutually masturbating and just like kind of making out and like wouldn't it be so hot if uh, you know uh, you came home and caught me in your panties so as a punishment you pull out a strap on and you make me take it you know mm. you would get to see how your partner would react to that and in that moment it's very different when you're already a little heated up because things feel more already more erotic like you're a little bit more open to it mm -hmm. to where if you were to have this conversation over lunch at applebee's you know they're gonna be like what i'm not gonna put my strap on and bang you like, <laughs> hey, quiet we're in an applebee's what are you talking about right, John? <laughs> quiet <laughs> yeah exactly well it almost sounds like that's more like introducing it from the wanting to incorporate that into a sex act how do you mm -hmm. do it when your motivation is more the relaxation and like trying to explain to a partner that you don't have a fetish and this isn't like a you know you need to be pegged or whatever but you're just doing yeah. it because it helps you relax how do you do that so the first thing that i was help any of my clients especially those that have not spoken to their partner about what they're into is they need to become an expert in what they're into mm. like be they should not leave a single doubt over what it is that they like but more importantly why why they like what they like mm -hmm. because uh, you know like kinks and fetishes are not like one panties fits all everyone is different mm -hmm. and everyone has a very different idea in their head of what something looks like mm -hmm. so and i'll give you an example you know like there could be this one guy who's like, oh, I really, I really have like this cross-dressing um, like fantasy and I really want my, my girlfriend to make me her sissy. And he's finally mustered up the courage to talk to her about it. Mm -hmm. And she's like, at first, she's like, I don't know, I don't know. But then she thought about, she thought about it and she's like, okay, well, let me look into it a little bit. And she's a little open to the idea, you know? And she's gonna be looking into what specification is, like learning from, who knows who on Reddit, you know, and there, again, there's so mm -hmm. many aspects and so many things that you can do in specification. One of them is like um, small penis humiliation, for example, uh. you know, she might see like, oh, well, um, in specification, there's small penis humiliation and then chastity play are very popular in that um, in that particular king sphere. Mm. So in those cases, the penis is is useless. So they call it a useless clitty, you know, so just <laughs> cage it up, just mm -hmm. cage up that useless clitty because we're not going to need it, you know, mm. and it's very, very prevalent in all of like in a lot of the porn and a lot of things that you would see online so mm -hmm. she might be looking at that and think like okay well this is what he wants so she goes and she gets a chastity cage and then the night comes you know he's so excited he's all like wet with anticipation he's mm -hmm. like finally my fantasies are gonna come true and she like walks in and she throws some panties on him and she's like put these on you know and he starts putting them on he's like oh my god finally my fantasies are coming true and then she's like and look at that small penis what a useless yeah. clitty and she starts laughing but he's maybe like has some insecurities about that uh, all of a sudden this fantasy is going to become a nightmare and that's because he did not take the time to be like hey i'm into cross-dressing and this is exactly what i like about it this is what turns me on or this it's not sexual for me i just like feeling mm -hmm. pretty i like feeling you know the the material on my skin and i think it would be great to explore that with you because i feel safe with you you know so if you can explain to your partner what it is that you want in a way that has to like you take all the guesswork out of for them you're going to have a better experience and it's the same thing with any sort of kink or fetish right because even with mm -hmm. like bdsm you can be telling your partner, 
hey, I really want to explore BDSM. And they're going to think like, like, and I want you to be tied up and I want to like, um, spank you, you know, mm-hmm. they're going to be thinking like, oh, you want to hurt me? Why? You're just violent. You just want to abuse me. But if they tell them like something about you giving your control over to me and feeling really safe and knowing that I'm not going to hurt you and that trust is just really a huge turn on for me, mm-hmm. then they can, Im- then they get a better idea of what it is that they want. And it's no longer something scary or threatening because you, you're very well aware. And that's like total informed consent, which is really what you want in all these situations. Yeah, exactly. I think framing it as an informed consent thing is is really important because like you said, if you only give a little bit of information, they're gonna go, oh my God, what the hell is that? They're gonna Google it. They're gonna see all kinds of porn and Reddit threads and all sorts of things that are gonna be varying levels of accurate. And each individual person has their own motivations. Like if you tell someone, Mm I've always been a submissive and I, I want to be your sub. And then they go, what does that mean? And they Google it and then they find that they're like, okay, that means she wants to be tied up and beaten and this and that. And she might be like right. a little. And, you know, it's like completely right, right, the opposite right. <laughs> side of the spectrum. So like unless you have those conversations about what it is that you actually like about an individual thing, you're not going to get what you want, right? You have to, it's right. a good step to say, hey, I'm into this. But then you have to be willing to go into more detail before your partner starts filling the blanks with a bunch of stuff that's potentially yeah. not going to be accurate. Yeah, totally makes sense. Exactly. So that's always going to be the first step is become an expert in what it is and why why it is that you like that. So you can explain that to your partner in a way that makes sense to them. Knowing what you know about them, you'll know mm-hmm. how you can best communicate it with them in a way that they can understand. And that is going to make it more likely for them to be willing to participate in that with you. So are there any particular activities? Like, let's say somebody is really into like the small penis humiliation side of things. Like, are there particular activities that are better for stepping into that? Because I imagine if you've had like a fantasy built up in your head for like 20 years of like, I can't wait to do this, you're going to want to do everything all at once. And that's generally not always the best way to do things with like a new partner that's also sort of exploring this with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say like baby steps, right? Because uh, you, one, I always think more of like, think about your partner, especially think about your partner first, because you're already, you know, you've been the one masturbating to this Mm -hmm. type of scenario and fantasy and porn and all of that for a really long time. It is completely new to them, you know? So even something that you think is a really small step may be a huge step for, for your partner. And if your partner doesn't have a good experience initially, they're not, why would they want to try that again? You know? So that's why it's so important to be like one respecting those limits and boundaries and discussing that, you know, and there's a reason why they're called scenes and BDSM, Mm -hmm. you know? they're really like they're discussed and sometimes depending on on how much of a control freak you are you might have like a whole fantasy down to a t you know Mm -hmm. but um being aware that your partner is just stepping into that it's just taking those baby steps where you can get a little bit feel how that feels let them feel safe and then the next time you can increase discuss you know how did that feel was that good for you you know like do you feel that maybe next time you would be willing to do this a little bit more Mm. because they need to be as enthusiastic about it as you are, or else you're not going to like it. You know, it's like, we've all Mm -hmm. been with like, uh, I think we've all had maybe like, uh, maybe a person who's more submissive or maybe more like mm-hmm. the submissive bratty side where they're with someone and that's not necessarily very dominant. And they're like, I want you to be dominant. And like, mm. they're like spank me and they spank and like, mm, that's not, you're not really doing it right. You know, it's like, mm. are they yeah. not really doing it right? Or are you not guiding them in the way that you need them to be? Yeah, exactly. You gotta, you know, the other person doesn't necessarily know what's going on or like what right. your fantasies are. And if they don't know what's going on, they're not going to be able to, live up to Mm -hmm. that uh i would say that based on your descriptions it does kind of sound that the uh the partner that's opposite the cross dresser or the sissy is is typically expected to be a dominant partner like with a capital d is there a way to make it work if your partner is more naturally towards the submissive side because i imagine there's a fair number of relationships where the male partner is probably like stereotypically masculine and like is six foot five or whatever but is secretly like really into sissy stuff and right, then his right. partner is like well i was with him because he seemed really masculine like a big strong man and like now he tells me he wants to like dress up and i have to humiliate him i don't want to do that like i'm more right. of a submissive myself how do i balance these things that is one of the hardest things for the partner to 
get through, you know, mm. to process because there is this fear of if I am more dominant, how my partner wants in the bedroom, then all of a sudden I'm going to have to be the more dominant one in our whole relationship, uh, you yeah. know, but that's not always the case. It's like the fantasy and bedroom activities aren't you're not going to be I mean th- some people will want it 24 7 but mm-hmm. I think if you're already in a relationship and it hasn't come up you're probably not in a relationship with someone who wants it 24 mm-hmm. 7 you know but even then you can still explore and just um having that open line of communication and again you know just taking those baby steps and then just checking in to be like okay like what can we do that's a little different now or how can we kind of like take this up a notch a little bit in a way where everyone's okay, everyone will start having more fun. And if they don't enjoy it, then, you know, then, then that's when you have that conversation of like, okay, we tried, I'm still not really feeling it. Like I like being, I like being submissive in every aspect of my life and not just, not just in regular day to day. I like being submissive in the bedroom as well. I've tried it. Like, once a month and that's still too much for me you know Mm -hmm. and then at that point you can decide are we a a, are we a match together or are there things that we can do to keep the relationship while still getting our needs met yeah i think in that scenario i know a lot of people that that's when they start like openly talking about going to see a dominatrix or seeing some other kind of service provider to get that need met do you find like in reality that actually ends up working for monogamous people or does that tend to just like cause like jealousy and worry and and break down the relationship yeah I feel like unfortunately it does end up having a lot of problems if a person is really you know you can't you can't be a really kinky person Mm. and like expect someone who is the opposite of that to really be like happy doing the things that you want them to be doing you know it's like I was telling everyone like don't invite a virgin to an orgy and get upset when they don't want to do anything you know (laughs) and that's why it's so important to discuss in the early stages of dating it's like a job interview you know Mm -hmm. you need to see if you're a good fit yes I know you want to impress and you want them to like you but what's more important is that you know if you're a good match and when the more if it like passes a third date by that time you're already like so busy trying to impress them that you start hiding things that Uh. you don't think that they would like so if from the beginning and the early stages especially it's more possible now than ever with the Mm -hmm. way with like online dating stuff like that where you can really have a conversation before you even have the first official date is to have those important conversations about like sexual compatibility you know Mm -hmm. just telling someone and the second date there's nothing wrong with saying like you know and at the second date is when you should be having those talks of like common shared interests and values and things Mm -hmm. of like, do we even need a third date? You know, at that point you say like sexual intimacy and compatibility is just so important to me. And I want to make sure that I'm meeting my partner's needs and that I'm able to be open about my interests. I have these interests. What are some of the things that maybe you're interested in? Mm -hmm. It's a really like, and I know it's like, it sounds easier than it probably feels in person, but the more that you get get the more that you do it it's just as easy as like do you want kids in the future you know yeah and i think that also goes with age as well which is you know when you're 18 or 19 and you're dating like a lot of people don't start out okay second day i gotta find out this is other 19 right right also want kids (laughs) but when they when you're 30 when you're 32 when you're 40 like if you want to have a family or have a second family if you were divorced or something like you have those conversations so much sooner because you realize you don't have time to fuck around and be like exactly i wonder if in two years this person will tell me or not if they want to have kids (laughs) you can't play those guessing games for forever you know better to be up front for sure yeah, maybe in two years they'll want me to be their submissive little maid slut, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. They're like, oh, maybe one day if I don't say anything, my dreams will magically come true with no exactly with no sort of stress on my part about trying to make it happen for sure. And that's when you run into trouble, right? Because mm-hmm. you're keeping something and then eventually, like I said, you you cross that threshold of wanting to where you're getting to know someone and trying to see if you're a good match and then you're just so busy trying to impress them to get that relationship or make them Mm -hmm. fall in love with you or get the ring or whatever it is that you're doing at that point you're just trying to make it work you know you're not trying to share like all of the sides of you and like exposing yourself you just want this person to to love you you know and then later on it gets really as the years go by it gets so hard to 
bring up something like that because at that point your lives just become so meshed together that you there's so much more at risk and you're like oh well if I say this and they leave you know like my whole life is going to be over so I'll just keep it a secret Mm -hmm. and then when they find out they feel like I've been living a lie they've been like this is a whole betrayal if they're hiding this from me what else are they hiding when really all it is uh, you know you like to put on some lingerie like yeah, <laughs> that doesn't like, mean that you're cheating on them <laughs> yeah i have to imagine that's probably a worry for a lot of people when they discover some lies because it can seem like oh my god i totally don't know this person that they're like are they right. cheating on me are they lying like what else they lied about and it becomes this fear of like well now i can't tell them because they're gonna assume all this other stuff and it just gets worse and worse so really the moral at the end of the day is talk early and talk about a lot of mm-hmm. stuff to make sure that yeah. you're gonna have a relationship that both of you ultimately want to have right exactly exactly and like you said earlier take the guesswork all the, like out of yeah. it you know like don't let them fill in any blanks because the blanks will always be probably even more hardcore than you are you know and yeah, at that yeah, point yeah. You're, you're thinking like oh i'm so hardcore but mm-hmm. they're thinking even more than what you're you're thinking at that at that point in time yeah, exactly. It almost kind of reminds me of ending up in like a sitcom scenario where it's like the, you, you, what you're thinking is, oh, I'm going to get to like wear her panties like around the house. And then she yeah. comes in like eight inch platforms, got a bought a corset, wearing a wig. Right. And as she's adopted like some kind of like Russian dominatrix persona. And you're it. like, whoa, <laughs> slow down. That's hot, but not what I wanted for right. this moment. <laughs> like, I wanted more of a sensual dominance, not... <laughs> Not like a traditional dominant. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Not like Domina Katarina from, you know, whatever. And I love it. Oh my gosh. All all sorts of things can happen. So really quickly before we wrap up, I think something we mentioned earlier is uh, anal training is like part of systemication. And I'd love to sort of explore that a little bit in terms of like anal training and pegging and how Mm -hmm. that's related to these kinks and like how you can also do it like without those kinks because i think also people assume that if you're a man and you're into things like that you're doing it because you're secretly gay or you're trans right, right. or whatever else yada yada mm-hmm. um yeah so i think so with anal training it's there's there's so many there's so many ways that you can go with anal training it depends mm-hmm. on what it is that you want you know some people do the anal training with the the elusive sissygasm they're trying to get the sissygasm which is essentially mm. like an anal hands-free orgasm and at that point you know when you're talking about forced feminization and sissification it's a transformation kink you know you're mm. transforming into the girliest come slight of all you know and part of that would mean that you don't need your penis to to get off you can orgasm just from anal penetration because that's just what a good little sissy slut you are you know or that's that's the gist of the gist of it yeah Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so with with anal training especially it's like you're trying to build up to have that hands-free anal orgasm Mm -hmm. so if that is what you're looking for my I always give everyone like this one tip that is like it's so simple Mm -hmm. but it's just so effective if you start you know and again you know make sure that you the eyes are bigger than your hole you know I like to tell people when when you see a toy like at the store and like go smaller than what you normally would think you would start with because when you're actually at home and you're using it if it's too big you're not gonna get it in you're gonna hurt yourself you're not gonna have fun and again if you're not having fun that first time like oh that i tried it and it just hurt and it burned and i'm not gonna do it again Mm -hmm. you know but if you start small like um think of the word training you know you're gonna start you're gonna take baby steps start with a finger work your way up but it, you don't even have to work your way that high up in particular for the sissygasm just because of the way that the prostate, where the prostate is, you know, um, in your body, it doesn't need to be too big. If the, the, the toy is too big, you might just miss it all together, mm, you know, yeah. but um, just having like a, a little toy and just kind of like bouncing on it. I tell everyone like bounce on it. Uh, that's usually a lot easier because you oh, won't yeah. need to so if you're sitting on the toy you know like stroke yourself while you're getting off you know and then as soon as you're about to get like really really close to orgasming like maybe like a second a second before you can just let go of the penis and kind of like (laughs) jump a little bit more and the toy will do the rest you know it'll hit that Mm. prostate and you will have that sissygasm that anal orgasm then the next time that you do it just let go like 
a second and a half before and then like two seconds it'll be a long process but eventually you will do it to where you've already trained your mind and your body to feel the the sensations and orgasm that way mm. um now in terms of you're talking with a partner and the partner is going to be doing the pegging there does there is some little differences with that one because the partner with the vulva is, doesn't feel like if your butthole's clenched shut you know they yeah, don't yeah, know yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't know and like i was talking with um with dr victoria on, on my podcast about about pegging and it's like the person receiving it is usually like they're they're already like thinking oh i'm already asking my girlfriend to to peg me they're gonna feel weird being like oh no it hurts uh, you oh, know yeah they'll just get mm-hmm. in and they'll get hurt so always have the partner the receiving partner choose choose a strap on i would say make sure that it's like a strap on with something in a little for you maybe like a little bullet or like a double-sided situation so you're also getting some pleasure while you're doing it you know use a lot of lubrication make sure that you're talking about those things before the more comfortable you get with talking about things like lube and like mm-hmm. safers and and all that the easier it will be for you to communicate like hey that you're going a little rough and even then i would recommend that person just like i told you like straddle sit down on it Mm. because you have control over it you have control on how low you can go how deep you can go how wild you can go Mm -hmm. and once it's already in there and your your butthole has gotten used to it (laughs) then you can go to doggy style and do all those other things Mm -hmm. um and really provide that positive feedback for your partner yeah after just having those conversations of like hey I'm really interested in having you peg me like I like I've been concerned about telling you this because I'm worried about the way that you're going to feel or if you're going to think differently about me. But just something about me surrendering my whole body to you and you touching an area that no one's ever touched before Mm. and giving me pleasure that way. Something about that is just so erotic that I really want to try that with you. You know, you're again saying what it is that you like, saying how it is that you wanted. You're giving you're taking a lot of that guesswork out and you're making it a we thing instead of just like I want this so you have to give it to me you know there has to be Mm. like a team approach and then you know you can start having having a little peg on yeah I feel (laughs) like that's that's really good to keep in mind because I think for a lot of people ask me questions about pegging like as the partner that would be doing the pegging they're like Mm -hmm. I don't understand what's this for me this kind of seems sort of selfish like why like why do I have to do this kind of almost like what's in it for me and having those things, like you said, like the bullet vibrator or yeah. the, the double penetration or not the double penetration, but the double ended yeah. dildo or just, uh, you know, even, you know, making sure that they orgasm first and then do the pegging. Like all of that mm-hmm. is really good to be able to build it into a mutually positive experience as opposed to right. like if you don't if you're not like very dominant yourself and you're like, why would I want to do pegging? Like, you know, seems weird. I don't know that, you know, you yeah. don't want to end up in a scenario where it just, you know, causes resentment for the relationship. Exactly. Right. And that's why it, it is really important to say all those things. And it sounds like a lot of communication and it kind of is. But the mm. more communication that you have up front, the more you avoid all those things that happen when you don't communicate, you know, yeah. like you said, they might do it and they, they'll they be resentful because they're like, oh, I don't know, this, what do I get out of it? They never had those conversations, you know? Yeah. Um, I always just remind people that are in that situation because like you said, you hear it in the comments all the time. I hear it in person all the time. Well, through screen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do yeah. it. But um, I'm always reminding people like, well, okay, what about when you're going down on your partner? Like, and you're just going down your partner. You're just using your mouth to go down your partner. You're not necessarily like, I mean, our throats don't feel that great when we're going down <laughs> on it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like you're getting pleasure out of giving your partner pleasure at that moment. Mm-hmm. So just think about pegging your partner in that way. It's not necessarily like, well, what's in it for me? What's in it for you is that you're giving your partner some pleasure. And giving your partner pleasure is going to make them want to give you that pleasure. Mm-hmm. And then... um yeah oh and back on the whole like positive reinforcement you know like even in those early stages when you're talking about the i really want you to peg me like giving that positive reinforcement of like you know i really appreciate that you would even have this conversation with Mm. me i 
love that you are even willing to consider this with me. That makes me feel that I'm with the right person or that makes me feel like I can really trust you. And it makes me want to do something for you. Like those positive reinforcements are going to go a really long way because, you know, when you it's going to increase the likelihood of them wanting to repeat those behaviors that makes them feel good. Positive reinforcement makes a person feel good. Yeah, you know, yeah. so when you're like, thank you for banging me up the butt with this <laughs> dildo, they're going to be like, you know what I think I'm to bang you again with the butt with the dildo because i just love the way that you praise me for doing that oh my gosh yes use people's praise kink that always works yes. like people yeah, who are yeah. really into the good boy and good girl stuff they'll do they'll do anything for that like yes yeah right, i have to be a top and i have to peg to get a good girl all right sign I me know. Up. <laughs> <laughs> also go with like you know, I always tell the, per the other, the partner who's new to it, the pegging partner, whatever you want to call them. It's like, also get into the right headspace for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, headspace is just so important. And find what is it that's going to make you feel sexy in doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, like tap into that. Are you wanting to be like, uh, a femdom goddess persona mm -hmm. or like really get into the fact that here you have like this man who's never been like penetrated before he's letting you do that like you mm -hmm. go girl you do that you know like anything that's gonna like hype you up for for the situation is always gonna be really really good and you'd be surprised at like what a person could come up with in their head to be like okay I think I don't like I don't like it like if I think of it this way. I don't like it if I just think like I'm banging my boyfriend of the butt. But if I feel like I'm some femdom goddess that, that you know, their servant is doing this for their pleasure or whatever, maybe I can tap into that. So find ways mm. that you can get excited because you need everyone needs to be excited about what's happening. If not, it's going to like it's going to go flaccid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got to find the right the right tempo. Yeah. So uh, we're almost out of time. But before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask if you had any other thoughts or anything around anything we talked about today that you want to make sure to share with the audience before we uh, end things. Mm -hmm. Yes, I just want everyone to remember that uh, it's uh, getting into kinks with someone who is not new to it is a process you can't just expect someone mm. who's vanilla to go chocolate overnight you yeah. know like that's not going to happen and you can't be expecting that from that other person or you're just setting them up for failure mm. think to yourself like be strategic about the situation one you're trying to get something out of it right but mm. you also what is it what's in it for your partner and how can you make this a positive pleasurable experience mm. for them if you stop thinking about yourself and you start thinking about that other person you're going to be thinking about the situation in a very different way that's going to take them into account and they're going to feel that and that mm. is going to make it more likely for them to want to even participate in making this fantasy a reality for you yeah exactly well thank you so much for talking with us today about all of these subjects carly you're welcome yes okay so so if people have questions or they want to see more of your content, where can they find you? They can find me at Carly DeVille, C-A-R-L-I-D-E-V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, everywhere, TikTok, uh, Twitter, YouTube, unless I'm removed in those situations. <laughs> but I'll be on there somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, I have a podcast, the Naughty Licious Sex Podcast, which you can find on all sorts of platforms, on pretty much every single platform. Mm -hmm. And I'm always open to learning more from, from you guys, you know, so there's any like videos any topics that you guys want to know about like i love talking to you guys you know i, I have a job talking to people so i love <laughs> yeah. really hearing it from everyone and what makes people like unique and what makes them like tick and jizz and come so send all that my way and i will see how i can help you <laughs> well thank you so much carly and thank you all for watching this video again any comments or questions you can direct that way or you can leave it in a comment down below. Thank you all so much for watching. Stay safe and I will talk to you all soon. Bye.